Good morning. It's time to start. If you'll have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. That's where we're going to begin this morning. We're going to move into Luke 14. Before we do that, let's um, look at our prayer list. Are there any updates to our prayer requests? So it was, was it Ryan and Lisa? Is that right? It's Pat, Okay, so the son of Aunt Patty, okay. So this would be like brother to Tom? Yes. Okay. Now, are they related to the, to the Chessers somehow? Okay. Uh, oh, okay. See, when I was at Jackson on Wednesday night, they... They heard the news, but they were actually saying it was Michelle's kid, and so I didn't know about that until, you know, Kenny sent me a text yesterday, so. Uh, Okay, so funeral Tuesday, uh, this was a a three-year-old that drowned in a pond on on Wednesday. Uh, Girls are out a lot in the... um, in the little swimming pool we have, and I got to admit, after hearing that news, I was just like a little extra cautious on on uh, Friday and Saturday with them with that. So, it's a terrible tragedy. Okay. All right. So, Kami is still um, waiting on scheduling the surgery. He needs to be cleared by your cardiologist. Cardiologist, there we go. Okay. Yes, remember Pauletta in your prayers, still struggling with pneumonia. Uh, next um, chemo treatment on July 7th. Sounds like Dwayne really likes that food, so that's good. That is good. I I think we have everything signed up for the next two weeks, uh, so uh, remember that. Uh, Send her a a text message or call her before you do it just to make sure everything's A-OK on that. But uh, I think it's mostly Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but I think we skipped the fourth. Um, I see Donna here. How are you doing? And uh, Albert, any updates on him? He's, he's making his way. I mean, the therapy is very hard on his own anniversary. You know, they're so afraid of people. He's having vision problems, and he still has no movement to the left, left side at all. And just, you know, like John just said about Paula, that's some depression and sadness. And <clears throat> so he's, uh, how long is he going to be there Missouri Delta. They, they only allow them to stay two weeks, is what they told me. Oh, wow. Okay. And could, he, could they do that in Palmer Bluff? Is that? There's one west of the hills. Okay. All right. So probably in about a week, he'll be moving mm-hmm. to maybe Westwood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any 
more updates? Okay, good. Yeah, so. What would, what would us guys do without the threats of our women in our lives? Uh, well, good, good. And he's still recovering from surgery. Are they thinking about chemo down the line or? Down the line, okay. Well, Morgan, do you have an announcement for us? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Let's see your left hand in particular. Ooh, <laughs> so bright. <laughs> Very happy for you too. All right, let's pray together. Dear God, our Father, we are so grateful for this new day. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, that we have life, that we have the ability to get up and, and to be here and, and that we have this opportunity to encourage one another. We have this opportunity to uh, lift up your name and to thank you for all you've done. We pray, Lord, that this whole day will be a, a day that brings glory and honor to your name and that, that we will be transformed in our lives by thinking about what you've done, what you've asked us to do, and, and help us, Lord, to grow in our faith and to be more faithful having been here today. We pray you'll be with our Bible class lesson as we consider how, how our faith requires effort and compassion, how it requires us to, uh, to be humble at heart. And I pray you'll uh, allow the, the verses that we read and study to uh, make a difference in our lives. I pray you'll be with all those who are sick. We have many on our list. And... Um, we're especially thoughtful this morning of, of Ryan and Lisa Shepard and the loss of their three-year-old. I pray you will give them comfort and peace beyond understanding and help their family through this tragedy. Um, bless them with faith and endurance in the days and weeks ahead as, as they continue to grieve and mourn over this great loss. I pray, Lord, that you will be with Bob Nepian. We're thankful that he is uh, recovering well and uh, is getting better. We pray for Carl and Ron with their treatments. We pray for Marveline as uh, she continues to recover and as she grieves the loss of, of a grandson and a son. We pray for Pauletta as we know she has so much on her plate and uh, we pray you will heal her pneumonia and that you'll heal her from cancer. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll lift her spirits up today and give her peace. We pray for Faye as she is um, having difficulties with her mind. We pray for Jude White as, as he struggles with leukemia again. We, be, we pray you be with Albert as he makes progress in rehab, and we pray you will lift his spirits as well. Be with Donna as, as she is right there in there with him, struggling with him and encouraging him. And, and we pray, Lord, that you'll help both of them at this time to find strength in you. We pray uh, again for Janice Eubanks, uh, that you will help her to continue to improve after her heart procedure. We pray for the kidney surgery that will happen tomorrow with our rather on Wednesday with Mason Miller. We pray for Hannah Robinson and what she's going through right now. We pray for Lori Reeds and his, his um, heart valve that's going to be replaced here uh, at the beginning of the week. We pray for Rick as he has his procedure this week. Help him and Donna as they travel. We pray that this procedure will make a difference for him. We pray for Connie Linderman as she is... Um, waiting on um, surgery and we pray everything will check out with that and they'll be able to remove it all. We pray for Wade King as well and we're thankful he was able to come home and, and we pray that he will continue to improve. 
Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. And we know, Lord, that you work in so many ways, some that we don't even notice. And we pray, Lord, that, uh, that we will trust in your work in our lives and the lives of our loved ones. And that each day we will walk by faith and not by sight. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 22. I kind of summarized it there in my prayer. It's kind of a hard section as far as what they gave us in the commentaries. It's kind of a hard section to kind of find a single thread to weave throughout the whole thing. And uh, really what this is doing is just bringing in... uh, a few different teachings of Jesus together as Jesus starts this ministry to Perea. Perea was a, a section of land that was on the opposite side of the Jordan River. Uh, Jesus leaves Jerusalem. He hangs out there for crossing over back into uh, kind of the mainland and then eventually heading to Jerusalem uh, towards his last week, towards his death. I uh, actually started prepping on some of the sermons um, Uh, on that this past week about Jesus' last week uh, before his death. And so that's coming up soon. It's getting close uh, as we continue this study. But the the thing that I prayed about uh, just a second ago, and and I think this is maybe the one way that I would summarize these sections together, is that when it comes to following Jesus, it requires effort, it requires compassion, it requires humility. I think those are some of the, the, the foundational blocks of our faith, and I think we'll see that in Jesus' teaching here. Let's go ahead and look at verse 22. Verse 22, he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? It's an interesting question. Will those who were saved be few? In our day and time, what would the question be? Would it be that? I I think it would be the same same question because there's a lot of of, uh, debate, I guess, in the religious world about that. Right. Yeah, there there is a group that gives it a, a certain number based upon symbolic language in Revelation, that 144,000. Uh, there is much debate. And probably maybe 50 or 60 years ago, there were a lot more debates, a lot more concern about it. But now as we continue on into history, what seems to happen? Are we as um, exclusive or are we more inclusive? Why won't everyone be saved? Someone say. More more inclusive now. Uh, The question I had is similar to Jerry's is how many people will be saved? So it's kind of the opposite of the question uh, because everyone has this in this mind. And and you've probably seen those stickers on people's car that say coexist. And they have all these different religious symbols on that thing saying that in, in some ways, it's a, a, a tolerant, extremely tolerant, and extremely inclusive way of viewing things. Now, certainly, as Christians, just because someone believes something different than us doesn't mean that we're mean to them. It doesn't mean that we persecute them. It, it doesn't mean we try to conquer them as a, as a religion or as a people. We, we know that's not the way of Christ. Uh, we are tolerant in some sense of, of the term, but we also understand the exclusivity of Jesus. And we understand that obedience to his word is something that requires much effort on our part and much effort to live by the word of God. And that's what Jesus gets into here as he replies to this question. Verse 24, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will, ent- will seek to enter and will not be able When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you have come from. And when they, uh, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence 
and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you have come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Look back at verse 24 to begin with. How do we enter the narrow gate that leads to salvation? Strive, struggle. I believe the Greek term was agonithe, okay, which has the, the idea of agony. There's kind of an agonizing thing that we have to go through to enter salvation. And um, we see this consistently through the scriptures. One of the, the scriptures that came to mind was my grandfather's favorite verses in the book of Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. In fact, I have a sermon of his, not just the, the writing down of the sermon, but actually an audio version. He had it, first of all, on a uh, cassette tape, and I was able to transfer it over to an MP3. So it is so awesome. But he spoke about this passage. This was almost his theme passage in his life as he was an elder of the church and was trying to encourage uh, his congregation in Florida. Second Peter 1 and verse 5, For this reason, because you partake in the, the divine nature, for this reason... Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. Self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. He says make every what? Make every effort. This is something that we have to be diligent about. And that's the word he uses in verse 10. Therefore, brothers... Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Okay. So he's talking about salvation here. You will never fall. If you are making effort, if you're being diligent to supplement your faith and to grow in the Lord, you will never fall. Which is kind of ironic because the, the terminology here that Peter uses of election and of uh, confirmation, a lot of that is religious language that Calvinists use. Now, if you don't know what Calvinism is, it's this idea, it's a, a system of belief propagated by a guy named John Calvin. And one of the tenets of this, this, this teaching is the idea of perseverance of the saints. In our day and time, we have we have our own little phrase for it. Once saved, always saved. All right, y'all have heard of that before. Ironically, we find a passage that says what? But that's, not so. that's not so. We can't just be satisfied with coming to Christ for the very first time. But it's something that we strive for. It's something that we, we make great diligence to make sure that we will never fall. But that possibility is there, correct? There's that possibility of falling away from the faith. Right. So if you really have faith, then it's going to be seen in your life. Faith without works is dead. He gets on in uh, verses 25 through 27. A, a similar um, a sim similar image that we see other places where God will shut the door, and that will be it. Those who are on the inside are on the inside. Those who are on the outside are on the outside. And here he closes the door. People are banging on the door. He says, who is it? <laughs> I assume he says that. And they said, Lord, open to us. And what's the response? I don't know you. I don't know where you come from. I don't know, I don't know who you are. And what do they respond So they had been in his presence. They, uh, you know, it says they drank in his presence and ate in his presence, and you taught in the streets. So, did they know Jesus? In one sense, no. 
And in another sense, yeah, they knew who he was. They knew his teachings. They had been in proximity to Jesus, but they hadn't obeyed the Lord. They hadn't got to know him through practicing his word and being obedient to his word. And so for those of us who are Christians, which I would imagine most of us who are here are Christians and have pledged your life to Christ, remember, just because you come and you're around religious teaching and you're around religious services and you're around the people who talk about Jesus, that does not mean that you are saved. You have to strive, you have to agonize, you have to struggle to enter the narrow gate. Make every effort. Make your calling and election diligent. It's not something that we can just kind of say, well, I was baptized and I can just sit back and do nothing. Faith without works is dead. You've got to put it into, into action. Right, right. So um, it's both and, right? But that's the emphasis here is that I never knew you or uh, where do you come from? I think that's exactly what, let's see. He actually calls them orcers of evil. So, you, where you're from, both of those right, Yeah, we try to cut a deal with God a lot of times and say, this is how I'm going to live my life, and me and God, we're, we're good with each other. Well, that's not what the scriptures teach. Um, and whatever told you that was not God, because God per- certainly has communicated through Jesus here to say, it's on my terms. Not on your terms, it's on my terms. All right. Uh, verse 28, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some who are first will be last. All right, so is Jesus' message, is it exclusive? Or is it inclusive? Okay, the message is inclusive. Okay, salvation is exclusive. So uh, everyone can respond. Everyone can respond to the message here. He's pointing out that even Gentiles can come to the faith. And that would not be a very popular thing to say to a Jewish audience at that time, to say that Gentiles can come to faith, and they're going to be reclining with these patriarchs. They're going to be at the table with with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob and all the prophets. Some of you Jews aren't going to be there. That would not be a very popular thing to say. And I think that's important for us to see as, as people who were striving to enter the, the narrow gate, the, the narrow door, that what we believe and what we practice and what we teach is not always going to be popular. I think I had a good reminder of that this week after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. I saw a lot of my friends on Facebook um, be very um, nasty. Let me, I'll just say it that way. Very nasty towards those who believe in the sanctity of life in the womb. And um, it, you're, we're going to have to stand alone on some of the, these things. We're going to have to be different than the world. And uh, certainly Jesus was different than his society, just like we have to be different from our society. We, 
we do a good job at these pendulum swings. And that's really what happened with the, the Protestant Reformation. You had the Roman Catholic Church that said, yeah, you have to earn your salvation, and you can do it if you just donate to the church. Um, and then you swing from that to the other side of the Protestant Reformation that said, well, you don't have to do anything. You just have to believe in your heart. Um, but yeah, that balanced view of saying we don't earn our salvation by our works. At the same time, if we are saved, if we have faith, we're going to be, we're going to have a working faith. We're going to have a diligent faith. We're going to have one that is obedient to the Lord. All right. Verse thirty-one. At that hour, that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, "Get away from here, for Herod wants." to kill you. All right, think about this. Uh, Pharisees in relationship to Jesus, usually a good relationship or bad relationship? Bad relationship, okay? Uh, they, for the most part, now there's some exceptions like Nicodemus, but for the most part, Jesus is head-to-head -head against the Pharisees. And here, they're warning Jesus of the possibility of being killed by Herod. Are they looking out for his own good? Okay, so it was, it was less about caring for him and more about caring for themselves. They didn't want any uproar down there. Right, they didn't want any uproar in Jerusalem. Maybe they thought that uh, by scaring Jesus, he would go out of the region or maybe... Um, uh, Jesus would say something that would really get on Herod's nerve and make him even more vigilant to kill him. Um, we just need to see this verse as they're not trying to care for Jesus. They're trying to undermine his mission. Okay, They're going to find any way, any excuse to undermine his mission. Jesus responds, and he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons, perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. All right. First, he calls Herod a fox, okay? How do we use that term in our day and time? Okay, so sly and sneaky. Did you say sneaky? <laughs> sneaky. Oh, yeah, yeah. That makes more sense, right? I'm sure they're sneaky too. <laughs> Sometimes we use it as like an attractive woman. Wow, that woman's a fox. You've heard that before. I know you have. Uh, <laughs> but uh, based upon uh, my research, uh, looking at different commentaries, it seems to be a, a different connotation here. Uh, if you remember back to the book of Nehemiah, they were building this wall around Jerusalem. And one of the things that the opponents of Nehemiah did was make fun of that wall. And he said, that wall is so weak that a, a fox can climb up on that thing and it would fall down. Okay. And so the way that they were using it was something that was insignificant, something that was even small could, um, could tear down your wall because it's just so poorly built. And it seems here what Jesus is saying to Herod is that you're not going to make a difference on me. You might think you're this big, you know, um, tetrarch, but in the end, you're not going to stop my mission. My mission is to go to Jerusalem, and no one and nothing is going to stop me from doing that. And I'm not going to be killed by you, Herod, because a prophet's not killed outside of Jerusalem. Now think about that for a second again, because most of these Pharisees would have been from Jerusalem, or they would have been in Jerusalem quite a bit. What do you think Jesus saying, you know, a prophet can't be killed except within Jerusalem? What? What do you think that would have expressed to those Jewish leaders? Stay worse than 
Okay, that he was a prophet. And ultimately what? They would be the ones that would kill him. Okay, so he's almost indicting them of uh, a future murder of himself and saying, it's going to be at the hands of the religious authorities that I die. And he's predicted that several times through the scriptures before that. All right, so that's his view of Jerusalem. It's going to be a place where the prophets are killed, including him. But then look at verse 34. And just imagine Jesus' face as he says this. Maybe he had tears in his eyes. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Think about how Jesus said that. Right after he acknowledged, yeah, this is the town, this is the city that's going to kill me. But I love them. I love them. And, and that's how we should view everyone who has differences of opinion, who have different faiths than us. We have to view them as someone that is loved by God. Yes, they're unwilling to follow Jesus, but, they, but, but, but God always wants to gather all of his people, all his creation in like a hen gathers her chicks. To me, it's just, it's not just, <clears throat> it, it really highlights the compassion of Jesus, even despite the wrong that was going to be done to him. Verse 35, Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I uh, believe that is a, uh, in some way, a forecast of what's going to happen when Jesus comes into Jerusalem on his donkey and uh, people start saying this phrase as he comes into the city. All right, chapter 14, chapter 14. This is a, a typical scene we've seen, I think, throughout this series. Uh, but again, Jesus is consistent that he's not worried about being trapped. He's worried about caring for people in their need. Uh, verse 1, One Sabbath when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him, and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. All right, so Jesus goes over to a Pharisee's house. This is something we see um, several times in the Scriptures. Actually, uh, this is the third time, and I believe final time, that this happens. Uh, the first one with Simon the Pharisee. Um, the second one was uh, with a Pharisee. Okay, one was Pharisee in Galilee. I think that was Simon. Another one was Pharisee in Judea. And this one is a Pharisee in Perea. Okay, so this is the third time he's accepted that invitation. And why did they invite Jesus to their house? To eat, but more than just eat, right? Okay, they wanted to trap him, uh, find some evidence, some incriminating evidence. Notice there at the end of verse 1, they were watching him carefully. Um, it's a little odd when someone is eating to just like stare at them. A lot of people get really self-conscious if you do that. <laughs> But they are, their eyes are peeled for anything Jesus did wrong. And, and then as soon as they're watching him carefully, it says, And behold, like it's a shock, there comes a man who had dropsy. Now, what does that um, disease entail, the idea of dropsy? The Bible says an abnormal swelling of his body. An abnormal swelling of his body. That's, that's really good. A fluid on the body. Okay. Uh, we think about congestive heart failure as fluid around the heart or maybe pneumonia with fluid on the lungs, but 
this seems to be a little bit like the whole body. And if I'm wrong about that, nurses, correct me. Have you ever seen someone with dropsy? Edema? Okay. Hmm. I hadn't heard that before. She's the expert in the room. Um, I would imagine it's very painful. I mean, I've seen people with a lot of um, the, the congestive heart failure and the, the pneumonia and things like that, but uh, this had to be very painful. And here, Jesus asks a question before he does the healing. The question was, is it lawful to do this on the Sabbath or not? And these people should know the law. These are the lawyers and the Pharisees. Is it, law is it lawful? So I get these questions a lot as preachers. Like, they're like, oh, I've got a preacher question for you. And I'm like, uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> um, like, people have questions about the Bible, and they, they go to people who maybe study the Bible for, uh, for their career or for you know, their lives, and they ask these questions, these hard questions. And um, these people who should have had the answer, what do they do? They were quiet. Jesus silenced his critics. They remained quiet. They didn't say yes or no. And I think they knew in their heart of hearts that they were wrong. That they were in the wrong here. But they remained silent. Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. And, you know, Jesus could have healed him on a Sunday. He could have healed him on a, a Friday. Uh, he could have waited the next day... You know, the sun would set, and that would be the next day. He could have waited, but when Jesus showed compassion, he was not willing to wait any time. He wanted to do it right then. He wanted to do it immediately. It wasn't just about proving a point. He really genuinely cared for this person in need. Uh, and so he said to the, the group, he asked these questions, you know, if you had a son or if you had an ox, if they fell into a ditch, what are you going to do? And, and it's a no-brainer. Right? That's not work according to uh, the Sabbath keeping rules. You're simply showing compassion on your child or on your animal. Uh, in fact, they probably might show more compassion on their animal than on this man with, with dropsy. Uh, and so again, Jesus shows, um, like I said, this comes up a lot in Jesus' ministry. He shows that it's always urgent to show compassion. It's always urgent to show care for other people. It was almost comical the other night. You were, you were out of town in Jeremy class, and the Pharisees told a bunch of people, don't you have days other than the Sabbath when you can come and be healed? <laughs> show up a day earlier or late. Come on. Yeah. Well, it wasn't coincidental, but uh, on the Sabbath, the guy with dropsy was there. It said, and behold. Mm hmm. Yeah. And then you know, a lot of times you even see Jesus on, in kind of like the same thing, little antagonistic by healing on the Sabbath because they're trying to trap him if he wants to do it. Just, you know. Right. Yeah, I think it probably was a setup. You know. Um, you set them up. <laughs> right, right. And that's. It's really, you know, a great strategy when someone is trying to pin you in a corner to ask your own questions. And, uh, but Jesus was going to do what was right regardless. Someone. Right, and, and Jesus, he didn't have to explain himself to these people. They were eventually going to kill him anyway. Um, I almost, the, the questions he asked, I almost think it might be just Jesus trying to extend the hand to anyone in their group that might be willing to come to him in the future. You know, you even see that with Jerusalem. He's saying, yeah, Jerusalem's going to kill me, but, man, I love Jerusalem. You know, I have compassion on Jerusalem. Uh, here, maybe maybe those questions were to get some of them thinking. And um, maybe Jesus had the attitude of, of, I don't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. So, All right.
last little section, uh, we've got about eight minutes, um, verses 7 through 11. Here is uh, what is called the parable of the wedding feast. Verse 7, now he, had, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, a typical feast was uh, kind of in a, a horseshoe shape. I, I know we have, uh, what was it, Da Vinci who did the Last Supper, and they're all kind of straight. Well, that was probably more so for the, the, the 2D element <laughs> of the of the photo. They are all spread out, and you could see everyone's face. But it was a horseshoe shape, and the host would stay at the, the top of the horseshoe. And whoever was closest to the, um, the host would have a higher place of honor because they got to actually dine and speak with the host. And, um, you know, you might feel this sometimes in restaurants, like, you feel like you're on the edge and you, like, you get put with all the little kids or something like that. And you're like, I'd like to be over there and talk with people my own age, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, sometimes you don't always get to sit where you want to sit. But, but I think we can understand the idea of wanting to be uh, closer to the host. But there's also this sense where these people wanted to be closer to the host to be seen, to have that place of honor. It's kind of make them seem like a big deal. I think we have that in our own culture as well. You know, the desire to want to be seen and to be viewed as important, okay? Um, and Jesus says that's not the right strategy. It's not to, to get there quicker than anyone else and sit in a certain place, but to do what? Right, take the lowest place, the furthest away, and then if the host deems you as, as uh, more uh, worthy of honor, they can move you even closer. So um, it would be, you know, it's a shameful thing to, for when people, if, if we feel the shame at least, when people um, treat us like we're less important than we think we are. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, you know, you, I don't know if you've had those situations where some people treat you really nice in private, but when you're in public, it's like they don't know you, okay? That's kind of a, an embarrassing thing for us. It doesn't make us feel good at all. And Jesus says, don't, don't try to exalt yourself lest you be humbled. Instead of humble yourself, come with the attitude of being the least, the last, and then at that point, the host will move you up. And that's how we have to be in our relationship with the Lord, not just with other people. Uh, I think it certainly applies to our relationship with other people uh, and how we need to take the humble road and not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, as Paul says. But it, it definitely has to do with our relationship with God in that if we try to exalt ourselves, he will humble us. Uh, but if we take a humble view towards him, then eventually he will lift us up. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. We have a song after this verse. Humble yourselves before, excuse me, humble yourselves therefore under the high mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So humble yourself before God, and he will exalt you in due time. Now, notice in due time. It's on God's timing. It's not on our timing. Uh, but if we have a humble approach at life, if we have a humble approach before him, 
eventually he will reward us for that humility. And so that's one of the virtues, one of the main virtues of the Christian faith is humility towards God and humility towards other people. Where we say, God, we are sinners and we are totally dependent upon you. But also where we say, like Paul, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm not deserving of anything. You've probably heard that phrase before, better than, I'm deser- than I deserve. One of my professors at Freed always said that, better than I deserve. And I think we need to have that attitude in all things, that we don't deserve anything because of our sin. We humble ourselves, and the Lord will exalt us in due time. Any thoughts on that? I think we have about two minutes left. Yeah, it's, I don't know if I would necessarily call that humility, though. Like, I, I think you have to have a proper view of yourself and, like, how God views you. I think that kind of dictates it, right? Because if you're, like, self-deprecating your, your, um, your, your life before God in a, in a way that we say, well, God doesn't care about me or I'm not important or God doesn't love me, I think that's, that's, that's not the humility of the Bible, Humility of the Bible is saying, I'm a sinner in need of God's grace. At the same time, God loves me, cares for me, and wants to be in a relationship with me. So that's a good, good thing to point out, yeah, to have that, that balance of knowing how, much, how deeply we're loved by God, but also how desperate we need Him for everything. So. All right, well, that is it. I appreciate y'all's comments. Hopefully we learned something this morning. and. Uh, May we all be compassionate and humble and diligent in our faith. Thank you.
sitting with us and uh, ask you to please fill out a visitor's card. You'll find on the back of one of the seats, you can fill it out and put it in the collection plate or leave it in the seat so we have a record of your attendance. I encourage you to pick up a bulletin. There's several things that in it I'm not going to go over. I'll touch on some stuff. I will say this in advance because Miss Cleo's just coming in. If you didn't get a rain, it was really dark a while ago, but Cleo went out and got her umbrella. So if she scared it away, it's Cleo's fault. <laughs> we were all staying just watching it, and she, she went out and got her umbrella. So I mean, so anyway, elders and deacons uh, meeting tonight at 5 o'clock. Uh, mark your calendars for the upcoming vacation Bible school. It will be July 24th through 27th. That's a Sunday through Wednesday from 6 to 8. There's a sign-up sheet in the back on the bulletin board. Uh, Joe's putting an outing together for a Cardinals ball game, and this is on the 11th at 6.15. The plan is to take both buses if needed. If there's a large group, then there'll be an overflow carpool. So anyway, sign-up sheet, it's open for anybody that would like to go. So please keep that in mind. Uh, please remember Ryan and Lisa Shepard. This is Ken Warren's nephew. They tragically lost a three-year-old son in an accident. So please remember that family. Susan Cullen is not with us this morning. She is homesick. Uh, Rick Holden will be having a procedure on the 30th in Kansas City. Please remember him. Loy Reeves, who is a friend of Donna Moore's, his heart valve is going to be replaced on Monday. And please keep Donna in your prayer. She's going to be taking some of the family up there for that. Albert Boving has been moved to rehab in uh, Sykeston. Kenny tells me that he met with uh, or saw Ron Cravens last day or so, and he said Ron is getting stronger. Pauletta Burns is struggling with her pneumonia, and they have put off her next chemo and treatment until July the, uh, the 7th. And in speaking of that, there's dishes in the back. Uh, they said, thank you very much. Most of the dishes or the bags have the names of the people that brought them. So you can pick up your dishes back there. Again, thank you for being with us this morning, and I will turn it over to Joe. Uh, I've got a few other youth announcements. So today at 3 o'clock, we're meeting at the church building. They have a little hangout as well. We're going to play some uh, fun games like Mafia. So um, please come. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and then also Friday, this is for the whole congregation. We are meeting at Bacon Park here in Popper Bluff. At uh, I decided to change it to 6 o'clock. But at 6 o'clock on Friday, we are going to have a picnic and hopefully a kickball game if we have enough people there. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so please, if you guys can come, please come. It's also 4th of July, so I know some of you guys will probably be gone, but if you guys have family coming, please bring them too. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, 6 o'clock uh, at Bacon Park on July 1st, this Friday, and I will send out uh, some reminders on Facebook and on email as well for you guys. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and stand for the first song. We'll sing Peace Like a River, number 865. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got love like the ocean, I've got love like the ocean, I've got love like the ocean in my soul. I've got love like the ocean, I've got love like the ocean, I've got love like the ocean in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got love like the ocean in my soul. 
I've got peace like a river, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got love like the ocean in my soul. Please be seated. We'll sing number 663, There is Sunshine in My Soul, and then we'll have our opening prayer. And yes, even though it's rainy, or even though it's rainy, uh, it's always a great day in our soul. We'll sing all four verses. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than woes in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful happy moments roll when jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in my soul there is music in my soul today a carol to my king and jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is springtime in my soul today. For when the Lord is near, the dove of peace sings in my heart. The flowers of grace appear. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today and hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now for joys laid up above oh there's sunshine blessed sunshine while the peaceful happy moments roll when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Let's pray together this morning. Father God, we want to thank you for the blessings of the day, Father. You have richly just granted us everything that we need and so many more things than what we want, Father. And for this, we are truly thankful. So we have this opportunity today to, to come together and worship you and lift your name up in praise. We hope we do so with a, an open heart, an open mind, an open soul, always giving that wonderful words of praise from our lips to you, Father, as so you richly deserve and that you ask from us. Father, there's those of us, uh, our number, that's, that are not as well as they'd like for to be, and we'd ask that you continually be with them. We're always mindful of Ron and and Pauletta and Carl and the struggles that they have. And uh, we'd ask that you'd be with them through their treatments. And we have those that will be going through procedures. And we'd ask that you'd uh, be with them and those that will be caring for them and help them as, uh, as only you can to have their procedures uh, go as great as they can. Father, we're mindful of the family who lost the three-year-old this past week. And uh, we have no idea what they're going through, Father, but may they always be looking to you for the strength and the courage and the guidance and have the faith that uh, that only you can survive, that you, you can only provide 
what they need at this time. Father, we are truly a blessed people, and and we're so blessed here at Green Forest to have Adam and Bethany with us here and for these years. And as uh, he opens up the word to us this morning, let us uh, look to the word that you'd have us to do. And that way we'd always be the happy and pleasant working Christians that you'd want in this area. Father, we uh, sometimes fall short of what you'd like for us to do, and we ask for that forgiveness. Uh, remind us to do better in the times coming and always praising you. And thanking you for your son that you've given to us. And it's his name that we pray this morning. Amen. Next song will be number 680. 680. There is not a friend. And after these next two songs, Rich or Rick Orchard will have our uh, communion prayers. There is not a friend. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one, none else can heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one, no, not one, Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the Lord. No, not one, no, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not. No, not one, no, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Number 859. 859. He paid a debt. He paid a debt. He did not owe. I owe. I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. He paid that debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. 
eternally shall it be glory to see him on that day i then will sing a brand new song amazing grace christ jesus paid a debt that i could never I'll be reading from Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 3 through 11. You'd like to be turning there this morning. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 11. We're about to come face to face with Jesus this morning. In John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11, Paul said, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we had died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died of sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. In baptism, we come face to face with Jesus in both death and life. There's another time when we come face to face with Jesus, and it's when we come around this table. This bread we break is symbolic of his body that was broken for us, and this cup we drink is symbolic of the blood that was shed for our redemption. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, Jesus said, For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Jesus is here today. We are face to face with Jesus this morning. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this avenue of prayer. We, we love you, Lord, and uh, this time we want to remember Christ, whose body was broken on that cross. We know it was for our sin that he had to hang on that cross, and we are sorry for that, but we're thankful that he was willing to die for our sin. In his Christ's name I pray, amen. Let's pray for the cup now as we prepare to take the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, once again, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for that sacrifice. We know that 
blood sacrifice was necessary to, to cover our sins. And we're thankful that Jesus loved us enough that he's willing to come and die on a cross and shed his blood for us. And in his name we pray. Amen. That concludes our communion services at this time. Uh, since the men are up, we're going to go ahead and take up our offering at this time. Um, if you're visiting with us, uh, we don't expect you to contribute, uh, but we do have visitor cards on the back of the seats. If you would, please fill one of those out and drop it in the offering plate. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us, and we thank you for the, the, the material blessings you provide that make this life more enjoyable. And uh, Father, at this time, we want to bring back a portion of what you've richly blessed us with. We thank you for it and ask that you uh, bless it for the building of your kingdom. I ask that you bless both the gift and the giver. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <laughs> The song before the lesson will be number 824, 824, I'll Fly Away. We'll sing all three verses of this song, and let's go ahead and stand as well. All three verses. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore.
be seated. The song after the lesson will be number 532, 532. The scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, and I'll read verses 15 through 24, Luke 14, verses 15 through 24. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, a certain man Gave, great, gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in, bring in here the poor and the maimed, and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. Good morning. Good to see everyone out this morning. Wonderful to sing praises of God uh, to the Lord together and to, uh, to pray, to consider the death of Christ and to open up his word to us. It's always a privilege to be with God's people on the Lord's day. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but I don't think he said anything about who is bringing the food on, uh, on Friday. And so I just assume that Joe's going to treat the whole congregation to a picnic. Is that right? Uh, no. Uh, no, okay. I'll bring snacks if they're the if they're drinks. Okay, well, you're on your own, in other words. Uh, snacks, cookies, and drinks he'll bring, but uh, just bring your own sack lunch. Is that kind of what you're looking at? Okay. Just want to clarify that for everyone, and hope everyone can come out uh, this Friday on that. There's one thing that I noticed uh, when I was in college. To be prominent among a, a group of my friends who lived on the same floor as me in my dorm. And what, what would happen is a lot of times I would go to these guys and say, hey, do you want to go and do this? And their response usually was very hesitant, like, oh, I'm not so sure. And as this continued to happen over and over again, I, I figured out what was happening. And that was they weren't willing to commit to doing something with me or some of my friends unless something better came up. Now, that something better could have been a girl that they liked. That something better could have been a group of friends they'd rather be seen with. That better could have been something they would just have enjoyed even more. But in essence, what they wanted to do was keep their options open. And then when they had all of their options, then they could discern what they wanted to spend their time doing. And while we might not do that with our friends who ask us to do this or that, in essence, that's what we all have to do with our time. We have to examine the options that are out there and discern how we're going to spend our time. In essence, how we're going to spend our life. We have to discern what is the best for us in each moment of every day. And this morning, you chose to come here to worship God together, and you chose that over and against anything else that's going on in the world today. Some of you came for Bible class, and you chose that Bible class over sleep or maybe some extra time to yourself this morning, but you chose to be here why did you choose to be here rather than anywhere else? You discerned 
some, some way, somehow, you discern how to use your time this morning. And it's so important for us to consider this because really our whole, whole fate is about how we spend our time. It's about how we spend our lives. And so we have to ask the questions a lot of times, what takes precedence? What comes first in my life? What is my priority? How am I going to spend my time? And that is so vital. So vital for our faith because Jesus over and over in the scriptures show us that he must come first. He must be number one. That he takes precedence over anything else. And for us and how we discern how to use our time, it will determine if we have a relationship with Jesus or not. It will determine if we have eternal life or not. And we see that in this parable in Luke chapter 14. Here in Luke 14, Jesus tells this parable that Elijah just read for us about a man who was throw, throwing a banquet. He threw a banquet, and by doing so, at that time, what they would do is they would send out invitations. They would send out invitations to people they wanted to invite, and that person would commit and say, yeah, I'll be there. I'll, I'll be at your feast. But then the preparation started. And once all the preparations were done and the, the feast was prepared and, and it was, everything was ready, then the person would send out their service again and say, hey, all things are ready. Come to the feast. That was a, a consistent way that they threw banquets at that time. What we find here in this parable is that the master had in, invited a bunch of people. They had said yes but when he sent his servants out, when everything was ready, these people who had previously committed, these people, they decided not to go. Jesus says about them in Luke chapter 14 and verse 18, but they all alike began to make excuses. This group of people, they decided to give this man an excuse why, he, why they could not Come. What we see here is there are three excuses given, and as we progressively go through them, they get even more rude and more rude and more rude. Look there at the first one. This is at the end of verse 18. The first said, I have bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please have me excused. Now, now if you just read that alone, this guy seems kind of like a nice guy. You see that he has a need. He says, I need to go see it. I must go out. He had a necessity. Something came up. Second, he uses the, the magic word. He uses the word please. And third, he, he asks to be excused. So that seems like a pretty polite way of excusing yourself. However, if you look at this excuse, it doesn't make much sense. First of all, who buys a field sight unseen? And why does he need to have a, 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 an examination of that field right then and right there? And plus, at that time, these banquets were often hosted at night. And in a time where they didn't have electricity or flashlights, going and looking at their field was not going to do much good. That's what we might call a lame excuse. The second one, verse 19, and another said, I have bought five oxen, a uh, yoke of oxen, and I must go examine them. Please have me excused. Here at first, it seems polite again, please, right? And please have me excused. He's asking to be excused. But again, why does this person have to do it right then and right there? By the way, he doesn't say, I must go here. He just says, I'm on my way. I'm, I'm going to these oxen. I don't have to do it, but I'm going to see these oxen right now. But why? Why did he have to do it right then, right there? Couldn't he have waited till the next day? Then the third excuse at the end, excuse me, at the beginning of verse 20, and another said, I have married a wife, and therefore... I cannot come. Uh, this man doesn't say please. He doesn't excuse himself. And he doesn't even say I need to attend to something with my wife. He just says, hey, I have a wife. 
I can't come. So this was the rudest of them all. And what's, what's ironic about this is that this man committed, while he had a wife, likely, he committed to come to the feast in the first place. But essentially what he's saying to these servants, he's saying that my wife is more important than honoring my word. That my wife is more important than what I said before. So we have these, these three excuses given. And I think we need to just say out loud, a lot of times when people make excuses, the reason they don't want to come isn't really in the excuse. I think we need to just say that out loud. I mean, when you think about a kid saying, hey, a dog ate my homework, likely the dog didn't eat the homework. And if the dog did, I mean, he should have had some fragment to show to the, the teacher to say that he really did eat my homework. And so a lot of times the excuses that we make aren't matched up with the true reasons behind why we want to or don't want to do something. And so we can't really judge what the real reasons were, but essentially what they came down to here with these decisions is they decided to choose something else or someone else over and against this man who had prepared this great banquet. And based upon their rejection, based upon them making these excuses, the master says, okay, well, I've got everything ready. Let's invite more people. And so he sends his servants out, and he tells them to go to the blind, to the crippled, to the lame, and to the poor. He says, go to them and invite them. Interesting enough, under the Old Covenant, Leviticus 21, we see that that is the same list, except for the poor, but the lame the blind, the crippled, those are the list of people under the tribe of Levi that could not approach the altar and offer bread before the Lord. And so, essentially, they were excluded back then, but Jesus in this parable is saying they're now included. Now they can come to the feast. Now they can dwell with the Master. And so these servants go to these people and invite them, and they drop everything and come to the feast. Well, when they come, the master looks around, and there's still some room left. There's still some places at his table. So he sends out his servants again. They go to the highways and the hedges of town, the outskirts of town. Likely those were the places where the outcasts live, the people of different ethnic groups, people who were maybe prostitutes or beggars. They, they still needed access to the city, but they were, in a sense, ostracized from society. And here this master says, no, bring them in. Come to the feast. They belong at my table. And so here, these people, both classes of people in the second and third way, they hear this invitation, and they come immediately. They come without warning. All the while, that first group, they had a warning, they had their commitments, and they still didn't come to the feast. And to that, Jesus says, he ends this parable in verse 24 by saying, For I tell you, none of those who were invited shall taste my banquet. He says, yeah, they might have been invited at first, but in the end, if they don't come when I call them, then they will not taste the blessings of my feast. And so here it's a great indictment against those who say yes to Jesus, yet don't come and follow him. At the same time, it's important for us just to think, I think, about the second and third wave. You got to think about them and their day. I'm sure they had plans on that day. I'm sure they had things to do, responsibilities within their household. They had probably some business venture to, to take care of. They were probably busy people as well. But when they were invited, there were no excuses. When they were invited, they dropped everything to come to the feast. They dropped everything. How amazing is that? Spur of the moment, they dropped everything to come to this banquet. 
I think we see, really, the priority. The priority that, that our master must have as Christians when it comes to our faith. That we drop everything, anything, to follow Jesus. And we see that as Jesus continues on in this passage. After this parable, he teaches a great amount of crowd, great many people. There, verses 26, this very hard saying. Verses 26 and 27, If anyone comes to me, does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, I often read this to people who are wanting to be baptized. I read this passage to them, and almost all of them are absolutely shocked. They're shocked. What? Jesus wants me to hate my family? Jesus wants me to, to hate my father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters? Yes, even my own life? How does that work? How does that work with, with the Bible talking over and over that God is love? What you have to understand is at that time they used that word hate and love to talk about covenant relationships. We see this in the book of Malachi as well as Romans where it says about God, it says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, did God really hate Esau? God didn't hate Esau. For God so loved the world, right? God loves every one of his creation. What is it talking about here? Well, Jacob was the son of promise. He was the one who was carrying the blessings of the covenant with Abraham. So when there was a choice between Jacob... And Esau, God chose to bless Jacob. When those things were in conflict, he chose Jacob. He loved Jacob, and it was as if, as if he hated Esau. This idea of loving is the idea of choosing them, making them the priority. The idea of, uh, of hating is this idea of rejecting. And so when we come to this passage in, in, in Luke 14 and it's saying you should hate your father, mother, brother, sister down the line, what Jesus is saying is when those things come in conflict with our covenant with Christ, we choose Christ. If there are family members that are discouraging us from coming to church, guess what? We choose Christ. If there are, are, are people in our lives that are trying to, to influence us negatively, we don't choose our friends. We choose Christ. If there are things that our kids want us to do that, that are in contradiction to what the Bible says, we choose Christ. If there's something even within ourselves that we want to do that's not according to what God has given us, we again, we choose Christ. When there's things in conflict... Christ must be chosen. He must be first. We see in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, that he makes this clear by saying, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, Jesus, he comes first every single time. You choose your faith over anyone or anything in this world, even if it's you. In fact, Jesus ends this teaching after talking about the cost of discipleship. He ends this teaching there in Luke 14 by saying in verse 33, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Everything's on the chopping block when it comes to our faith in Jesus there's something that violates our faith, we have to renounce it. We have to deny it. And we have to follow Jesus. And so, when we think about this parable, and we think about Jesus' teaching, I think the one principle we can take away for all of our lives is this. When Jesus calls you to come, you come. When he calls you to do something right then, right there, on the spur of the moment, you do it because you love Christ so much. When Jesus calls you to come, 
you come. The thing is, a lot of times with us, especially within the church, sometimes we have a false security of our salvation. And we think just because we became Christians once, or just because we rarely come to church every now and then, that we're good, we're safe, we're, we're fine. But the thing is, this parable and the subsequent teaching, it was said after someone said a line that showed a confidence in his salvation, but it was a false confidence. There in Luke chapter 14 and verse 15, here Jesus reclining at the table and someone says among him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. That was the line that started this parable. Blessed is he who eats bread in the kingdom of God. Now, now why would you say that unless you had a confidence that you would be in the kingdom of God? You wouldn't. You're saying, yes, I'm going to be blessed because I'm going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Jesus, it seems, in this parable is trying to contradict that false assurance. He's trying to say, yes, you might have said yes to God once, but you have to come to him over and over and over. You have to come to him even when it's difficult. You have to come to him even if there's something or someone in your life that's important, that's, that's discouraging you from following God. You have to come no matter what. You can't make excuses in the kingdom of God. That when Christ calls you to come, you come. You've probably seen this meme before. I saw it spread a lot on Facebook. And that is, church should be your excuse for missing everything else. Church should be your excuse for missing everything else. How easy is it for us to mix those up? Right? It's so easy for us to mix those up where we are making excuses not, go, not to go to church versus the other way around. But the thing is, when it comes to our faith, it's much more. Our faith is much more than just coming one time a week on Sunday morning. It's, it's much more than just meeting together. Our faith is about making that daily choice that when Jesus calls us to come, we come. It's that daily thing that we have to, to face, that, that if Jesus calls us to care for the needy, we come. That if Jesus, if he calls us to get a little uncomfortable and invite someone to church or to have a Bible, with some, a Bible study with someone or talk about our faith, that we come because he has called us to come. It means that if God has called us to be the spiritual leader in our household, that we come. We step up to the plate. We're there for our family. We lead them in the Lord. If the Lord calls us to, to care for foster children or to adopt a child. If, if he calls us to step up and care to the least vulnerable of our society, we come. We step up. No matter the cost, no matter the season that we are in our life, no matter who in our life might object, when Christ calls us to come, we come. Jesus should be the excuse for missing out things in our world. Missing out on things in the, the world. Jesus should be that excuse. He should be that reason. Because whenever there's a choice between someone or something or, or something even within ourselves... If we have to choose between that and Jesus, if we're going to be his disciples, if we're going to have the hope of eternal life, we need to choose Jesus. When Jesus calls you to come, you come. No matter what stands in your way, no matter who might discourage you, no, no matter what else you might want to do in that moment, when Christ calls you to come, to obey him, to do his will, to make him first, you come. And this week, as you go forward and you think about how you use your time, how you use your life, how you make decisions on what to do in, in this moment or that moment, have this phrase in your mind. When Jesus calls you to come, you come. 
you want a relationship with Jesus, if you want the hope of eternal life, we have got to come when He calls us to come. Because only when we come, not when we say Jesus, yes to Jesus initially, not when we just, just are baptized, but every day we have to come over and over and over, come to the feast so that we can enjoy the blessings of our God, so that we can enjoy the blessings of eternity with Him. When Christ calls you to come, come. Let's pray together. Dear God, our Father, we are so grateful that you show us how we ought to live our lives, that you have given us an instruction to show that, that you must be first, that you must be our priority, that we must deny ourselves and even deny the people who we're closest to, that we have to deny those things to follow Jesus, and that if we do that, if we come when we are called, that you will give us blessing upon blessing. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you for giving us that promise. But I pray as, as we see that promise that we will live up to your call. And each day of our lives, no matter what you put before us, that we will follow your word, that we will answer your call, and we will come to you, leaving everything that we have to behind to follow you in all things. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe there's someone here this morning that has not made Jesus your priority. First, you do that by, by becoming a Christian, and, and you do that with, with having faith in your heart, willing to turn from your sin and to be baptized into Christ. That's how you start the journey. That's how you say yes to Jesus. But you come to Him every single day. And maybe there's someone here this morning that has not denied themselves and denied others enough to make Jesus number one in your life. That when He has called you to come, that you haven't come. That you've made excuses and you've stopped following Jesus. If that's the case for you, we would love to help you in your journey. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to encourage you. We'd love to wrap our arms around you and tell you we're there with you. If there's anyone who has any need this morning, come forward as we stand and sing this invitation song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our Lord. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children, in His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellence. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, from Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, the Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming, o'er the world victorious. 
Adam so much for that lesson. Uh, as you guys go out uh, today, um, try not to make those kind of excuses and to focus on God in your lives. Thank you. That was an amazing lesson, Adam, and always important to hear. Um, we'll have, the closing song will be number 627, 627, the Glory Land Way, and then we will have our closing prayer. 627. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. Guide in the glory land way. Wanderers come home, oh, hasten to obey for I'm in Glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go. The glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Dear God, we'd like to thank you for another day of life. We pray each day, dear God, that we'll live closer to you, that whatever we have to leave, we will leave to serve you. We also ask you, be it those that are sick in our number, we have several. Pray that you will guide the physicians that are tending them and they might regain their health once more. We pray that you'll bless our family that meets here. We love each other. We pray that we'll always stand for the truth and never be led astray. We pray for those that have wandered from your fold, dear God, that they will come back to you before it's ever too late. We're so thankful for Jesus and the life that he lived and the death that he died. We're so sorry that our sins put him on the cross, but we are so thankful. We pray that you will guide us this day on through our lives and may always save you. In Jesus' name, amen.